All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, Happy New Year, of course. Um, where we left off at, um, just to jump right into it, we left off at the first part of Chapter 10 where we were talking about rapid spanning tree, right? We're talking about the upgraded version of uh, spanning tree, right? Um, so I'm not going to go into detail, of course, of uh, what rapid spanning tree is. I think we have enough lessons and videos on that. Um, just, you know, quick quick lesson on, you know, the last few things of the RSTP section, right, is the RSTP configuration options, right? Um, you guys have seen it before in the lab, and of course, during the lab tomorrow, I'll go ahead and uh, give you guys a quick reminder and uh, refresher, a quick glimpse at it. But of course, you are able to, of course, switch the switches priority, right, to influence, um, you know, root election, right, root bridge election, or of course, um, the secondary root bridge election, right? You can go ahead and modify that. You can also, of course, configure primary and secondary root switches, right? Using that command, we you guys have seen that before. I will do it again in tomorrow's lab, right? And last but not least, because of course, spanning tree um, relies on cost to make their elections for root bridge, path selection, or what have you. Um, you are able to go ahead and manipulate port costs, right? To go ahead and influence the spanning tree, uh, algorithm and topology bin, all right? So that's it in regards to rapid spanning tree, right? And it's all gonna come together. But next, right? Because of course, chapter 10 is talking about RSTP, but it's also talking about ether channel, right? And what is ether channel, right? Right, and so we're gonna go over it, right? But first things first, I want you guys to take a screenshot, take a look at this, right? And to understand how to first, right? Because this chapter is called configuring RSTP and Ether channel, right? You guys need to take a screenshot, whatever you have to do, read this again um, on your own time. It's to understand how to configure a Ether channel. And I'll go over what that is in a second, right? And so to configure Ether channel manually, right? You use, right? If you're in a Cisco switch, right? You go to configuration terminal, right? Because we're making a global change that affects the dynamic of the switch, right? We go ahead and go into global config mode, right? We go right into an interface that we want to be a part of the ether channel, right? And then once we're in the uh, interface configuration mode, we then go ahead and say, hey, channel group a number mode then on. And this only this only pertains to a manual layer two ether channel, right? You put that configuration on interface configuration mode under that physical interface and it will add that physical interface to the channel, right? And of course, if you have other physical interfaces you want to add to that ether channel, of course, you can do the same thing, right? And use the same channel group number on those, uh, on those other interfaces, right? But now, now that I went over what, how to configure an ether channel, right? Let's go over what it is, right? So we've talked about spam tree, we've talked about the purpose of it, right? One of the main purposes of it is for redundancy, right? Um, but trying to go ahead and um, and to achieve redundancy, right? We're also attempting to achieve loop prevention, okay? And so that's why rap, you know, spanning tree and ether channel goes hand in hand, right? And so you see that little circle, right? What that means, whenever you see that in a diagram, that means it is bundling physical, right? Physical, um, physical cables, right? Physical um, medias, right? Together into just one, right? And so with this, right? Without that circle, right? If we're talking about spanning tree, um, switch one and switch two, right? So their interfaces would be their own individual interfaces, which means the spanning tree algorithm would have to one, pick a root bridge two, pick a designated switch, right? And of course, elect on which ports I'm going to forward traffic and which ports I'm going to block traffic. Because again, we do not want to create a broadcast storm or AKA a loop, right? And so, right? And of course, well, I don't want to have to keep doing, right? From a switch standpoint, I don't want to have to keep doing spanning tree algorithms, right? Whenever maybe interface goes on and off or what have you and calculate per interface. Right, because we're we're looking at four interfaces right now. So with this, right, spanning tree would work, right? But what happens if we have these two switches, right? And they have to handle a lot of traffic, right? 
right? Maybe uh, one gig worth of traffic needs to go over one link, right? And let's say switch one and switch two, right? That one gig link is only going to be, um, you know, and uh, ignore the yeah, FA, which of course needs fast Ethernet. If it needs to go over 0 0.14 and 0 0.60, right? If it hits its capacity at one gig, right? what the switch is going to do on the interface is drop that traffic, right? Because it's at capacity. And maybe that's the only path it can take. Because of course, remember I told you, spam tree is going to block one of the ports, right? What can we do to go ahead and efficiently, right? Efficiently have a topology to where we can pass traffic, right? We can increase bandwidth, right? while also preventing loops, right? This is where Ether Channel comes in, right? And what Ether Channel does, right? It bundles physical ports, right? From a software standpoint, right? To virtually make them one port, right? Which of course would be one Ether Channel, all right? And so what happens, right? Whenever it's passing traffic, right? Whenever it's passing traffic, it's no longer, right? deciding, oh, I have one block port and one forwarding port, right? As in spanning tree. Now, right, if we're looking at this diagram, right? Zero um, interface 14, interface 15, right? They're all one port channel, right? One ether channel, right? Ports 16 and 17, they're one ether channel, right? And so now from a spanning tree standpoint, it doesn't have to block on no ports, right? Because from a software standpoint, they are acting as one huge port, right? So let's go back to the example I was talking about, right? So if we have one gig of traffic passing through, right? Right? One gig of traffic passing through. From an ether channel standpoint, now this interface, right? It's no longer just 16 and 17. Now it's, it's ether channel two if we're looking at uh, switch two it now has a two gig bandwidth limit, right? To pass over this quote unquote virtual port, right? The ether channel, right? And so what the switch will do now, this is out of scope of the CCNA, right? What the switch will do, and we'll talk about it in the next section, will, if it has a one gig of traffic it needs to pass through, it will, right, load balance that traffic, right? Right, sharing the load, between both physical interfaces, right? And of course, from software standpoint, it'll, it'll act as if it's going through that ether channel, right? Because technically it is, right? It will, that traffic load will now be shared. So traffic will not be dropped, right? If it's going over this ether channel, that load will be shared. So one gig will be split up. So it'll be 500 megs here, 500 megs there, right? It'll be shared across these gigabit interfaces, boom, okay? So from a high level, that is what a ether channel is doing, right? I know that was a lot, but stay with me. And of course, you guys probably see it in your day-to-day. -day. You guys probably see it in your data centers or what have you, maybe in your you know local home office or what have you, all right? But the core thing is, right? Because what I just showed you is how to configure what you guys just saw, right? I explained what Ether Channel was, right? But the configuration example that you saw beforehand is how to manually, right? To manually configure a Ether Channel, but to set it statically, right? What do I mean by that? To go back to the diagram, right? If you plug up these two switches, right? They're not going to automatically become right even with some configuration they're not going to automatically become um you know uh perform an ether channel for those interfaces right that has to be some configuration right so you have options you can either set it to where it's always on right set it to manual right or you can set it to where whenever it plugs up to another side that's um also the ether channel it dynamically comes up right? You don't have to every time, right, set it or what have you. Maybe you get another switch and you plug it up. It'll automatically become part of the Ether channel um, tunnel that we're creating, okay? So again, this way, 
right? It's setting it to manual, right? And the key word to how you would know that it's manual is using the word on, right? Mode, channel group, the number, mode, and then on um, specifies it to be a manual layer to ether channel, right? And on the opposite side, we have dynamic layer to ether channels, right? And it's exactly what I was saying, right? From a theoretical standpoint, if you put some configuration in on these interfaces, right? Dynamically, they'll go ahead and become an ether channel. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to go ahead and say, hey, mode on, mode on. It'll automatically, right? I like to call it automatically. Go ahead and become a ether channel, right? Maybe you want to go ahead and switch out, switch one, right? It's faulty. You bring in switch two, right? You put, you know, you do you use the different um, keywords, right, for mode or what have you. It'll go ahead and automatically plug up and say, hey, now I'm going to eat the channel, right? And so it will dynamically, it doesn't even know any information. It'll automatically become a eat the channel, okay? Now, you guys can see, right, there's two ways to dynamically configure a layer two eat the channel, right? The first part, let me go ahead and get my pencil, right? And this is important because you guys need to know this for the exam, right? Cisco, right, from a high triple E standpoint, uses two methods, right, on their switches. It's either can use PAGP or you can use LACP, right? So PAGP, right, PAGP is a Cisco specific, right? That is a... Um, something that's only on Cisco switches. LACP, right, is what you will see everywhere from a high from a high level standpoint, right? And of course, the term for PAGP is, of course, Cisco Proprietary Port Aggregation Protocol, right? That's what PAGP stands for, right? LACP, right, of course, it being a IEEE standard, stands for Link Aggregation Control Protocol, okay? And that's based on the IEEE standard 802, dot three, which falls under Ethernet, AD, okay? So, right, these are the two ways, right, that it can dynamically become an Ether channel. And you guys are probably thinking, well, Dave, how does it dynamically become a channel if we still have to configure it, right? So what happens, right, is these ports, right, these switches are performing negotiations with each other, right? Right, and they have to do checks. They have to go ahead and say, "Hey, do you have the right speed? Do you have this? Do you have that?" Before we become an ether channel, what does that do? Right. What that means is, if Maurice, being the network engineer, right, is configuring right two switches, right, in manual mode, right, manual mode is not going to check and see if the speed and duplex is the same on both sides. It's not gonna check to see if it's uh, maybe a you know trunk or access ether channel. It's not gonna check any of that, right? Why is that important? Well, if those values I just told you are not the same, it will not become an ether channel, right? And if you configure this in manual mode, right? You won't even see an error, right? You just configure it on both sides. No syslog will pop up and no nothing, right? And you'll realize, right, you'll do a show ether channel summary, right? And you'll say, why isn't the ether channel up, right? And of course, you guys being CCNA candidates, you guys will learn, of course, go into the logging buffer or what have you, and to go ahead and investigate. But with dynamic layer two ether channels, you don't have to do that work. It does it for you, right? As soon as you say maybe one side to be, if we're talking about LACP, right? One side to be active, one side to be passive. Excellent. Those two switches, switch one and switch two, will do those checks for you. And if they fail to check, it will pop a syslog message. And we're going to do this in the lab. It's going to say, hey, it failed. Um, you configured something wrong. So check layer one and layer two to make sure the speed and duplex is configured correctly, right? So that we can become a ether channel, all right? So it will do those checks for you, right? Along with that, right, it'll it'll continue to communicate with each other to make sure, hey, we're still active, we're still good. Yes, we're still good, right? Right. If we're talk, if we go back to talking about manual mode, right? Maybe one side is faulty, right? One port is faulty. 
You'll never know. It won't give you an error. You'll never get a syslog message. That's the downside with manual mode. Okay? Right? Dynamic mode, and of course, it'll dynamically become an ether channel. And it'll do some checks for you, right? It'll become, it'll do these negotiations we're happy that I spoke of. Okay? All right? Hopefully that makes sense. Let me go ahead and take that off my screen. Any questions so far? All right, cool. All right, so this is an important part that you guys need to know for the exam and also, of course, for your careers. Do not use the on parameter on one end and either a dynamic configuration, dynamic layer to ether channel um, configuration parameter on the other end, right? Either be LACP or PACP, right? On the neighbor switch, right? The on option uses neither PAGP nor LACP, right? So what this, what Cisco is trying to tell you guys, right? And trying to tell us, right? Is that manual mode doesn't send negotiations, right? At all, right? Even if you have manual mode on both sides, it's not sending negotiations. It's saying, hey, you're set to on, you're set to on. Now I'm a ether channel, right? It's not going to do any checks with the other switch, right? It's going to, it's not going to verify. Right, so you cannot, <laughs> it's not possible to go ahead and say, hey, on on one side, maybe LACP or PACP on the other. It will not work. An ether channel will not come up. All right, so remember that golden rule. Right, all right. So remember, I told you guys values need to match whenever you're configuring ether channels. These are the values that need to add, that need to match before an ether channel becomes an ether channel and works properly. One, speed. Two, duplex, right? Talking about layer one and layer two, right? We're still here if we're talking about the OSI model, right? The operational state of these interfaces that are part of the ether channel, right? You can't have some as an access port and some as a trunk port. All must be access and all must be trunk ports, right? All right? So next, right? If if one port is an is a access port in one VLAN, right, and another port is an access port in a different VLAN, will not work. They have to be the same, right? So if you have a access, right, a access uh, level ether channel, it needs to be either all VLANs, right, or the same VLAN for the entire ether channel, right? If it is a trunk port, right, a trunk layer two ether channel, right? Right? The allowed VLANs need to be the same, okay? The allowed VLAN list needs to be the same, right? Also, if it's a trunk port, just like a trunk, right? If it's a trunk port uh, ether channel, right? It needs to have the same native VLAN, right? Um, native VLAN meaning the same VLAN to where whenever traffic is passing over that, Ether channel, right? Packets that travel through will be marked not with a VLAN marker. It will be what they called untagged, right? If you have packets that have, from a layer two standpoint, um, have a tag, maybe VLAN 10, maybe VLAN 20, it is called a tagged packet, right? Traffic that's passing through that doesn't have a tag is considered untagged, right? And of course, it's considered going over, right? It being part of a native VLAN. Okay. Last but not least, the S, the spanning tree protocol interface setting must be the same if you're adding physical interfaces to be part of an Ether channel. And of course, it needs to match on both sides, right? One switch to one switch, one peer to one peer. Okay. So, what did I mean when I was talking about LACP or PAGP gives you error messages, right? And lets you know, right? So if Mo wants to goes ahead and configures, right, one side to be PAGP or LACP, a uh, dynamic layer to ether channel, and another side to be manual, here is what syslog will do, right? It'll go ahead, right, and one, right? And for this example, right, there's a spanning tree cost misconfigured. 
the switch will say, the CPU will say, hey, Mo, this is not going to work, right? You have, I did all the checks, right? There's a misconfig as it relates to spanning tree for gigabit interface 01 and gigabit interface 02. So I'm going to disable, right? I'm going to disable um, ether channel or port channel one, okay? And put it in an error disabled state, right? Uh, we'll talk about error disabled state in further chapters, okay? But basically I'm the switch is going to disable the port, okay? Right, and of course, as you see, it's gonna change to down, to down, to down, right? And of course, you do a show ether channel summary. You will also see, right, that port channel is down, right? Port channel slash ether channel is down. By the way, port channel, ether channel, it is the same thing, right? Um, so, when, so you can refer to either or, makes no difference, okay? Um, this is Cisco funky thing, all right? So remember that we are going to go over Right, how to configure ether channels tomorrow, right, in our lab fun day, right? And that'll be the end of our week, right? I encourage you guys to read chapter 10. Yeah, I cannot stress it enough. Read, 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 read. A lot of the Cisco exam, right? A lot of the CCNA has to do with theory, right? It's probably 20% configuration, right? And configuration easy. We can go ahead and push buttons, but you have to understand the theory. Okay. You guys have a great day.